V. We have a lot to talk about today on a Monday, getting near the begin, the middle of the month for July. It's flying by. Of course, we're going to talk about the housing market, not just any old news on the housing market. There's indications that we're not at the peak of the housing market. There's a lot of predictions and even data that shows that not only home prices will go up, but interest rates will go up. Usually when interest rates go up, home prices go down, but there's some data and reports coming out that show that both of them might go up in the near future. And we'll talk about why and how it's related to the larger employment market and the overall economy. Of course, uh, we're also going to talk about the uh, automotive industry. And there's some uh, data coming out today from one of the largest automotive processors, Mannheim, where there's a crash in used car prices. Uh, that may affect uh, your uh, trade-in value, may also affect if you're looking to buy a used car, what's available. But at the same time, some new cars are also going up, but there's one area of new cars where the prices are going down because there's too many of them. And that could be related to some government regulations. Uh, we'll also talk about some scams with auto sales where there's some fake ghost dealers selling vehicles that they're not supposed to be selling. And last, of course, we'll talk about um, the cyber market and um, more commercial uh risk and liability markets. So first, as usual, one of the most common uh, subjects that we talk about is real estate. So everybody has a stake in real estate, as we always say. You're either a renter, a home buyer, a home shopper, maybe trying to sell your home. And the price and value of resale property is of interest to everybody. Even if you're not in the market, everybody wants to know what's going to happen with real estate prices. And everybody's got an opinion. Some people say it's going to go up. Some people say it's going to crash. A lot of people wish it will crash so they can afford to buy a house. Uh, some people say, well, it's going to be like the crash of 2008 because prices went up so much. Uh, but what are the facts? Not what are opinions, but what are the facts? Let's take a look at some data as we always do on this channel um now granted we always look at the source what is the motivation behind the source this comes from realtor.com of course that's a real estate industry amazingly 2023 is not the most unaffordable it's ever been to buy a home not even close well in some ways, Realtor.com will probably want to have an opinion about house prices. They probably want them to go up or sell more. But they also have to back it up with facts. Yes, we've heard it. Buying a home might seem like the most unaffordable and impossible. And for many people, it is. Mortgage rates are near 7%. But here's the thing. Baby boomers had it worse. Is that true? How could it be true? The typical buyer spent just under a third of their household income on housing. That may seem uncomfortable, but it's not even close to how much buyers paid in the 1980s. September and October of 1981, buyers spent 51% more than half of their household income on their mortgage payments. Right now, it's 32%. Forty years ago, it was 50%. Could that even be true? Well, here's the thing. The price of homes was much less. You could buy a really nice house for under 200000 I can remember in the 80s seeing great houses for 180, 190. You could almost buy a mansion for 250 to 300. If you bought a quarter million dollar house, that was a big deal in the mid 80s at the same time the interest rates were outrageous they were over 10 percent so when you add that together plus the fact that incomes were lower it makes for a very expensive housing market and here's the share of income going to housing over time Sure, where we are here right now, over 
is higher than what it's been for, you know, 20 something years, right? It's been down in the mid twenties for a long time, but here's the thing. This is only a lot higher than what it was since 2019, right? If you go back to 2007, it was at 25%. And most of the past two decades was in the mid to upper 20s. It's at 30, you know, just over 30% now. So it is higher. But all of this time period right here from 90 to let's call it 2005 or six was always in the mid to upper 20s, up and down. And then it went low. Why did it go low? Well, because of interest rates. Interest rates dropped and the, and the housing cost was in the teens and 20s. That was an anomaly. That was pretty rare. It almost never went below 20% all the way back to the 70s. Now it did spike up. But this spike is only marginally higher than what it was most of modern history. In fact, for this period of time right here, here's 30, 1979. Here's 1986, right? That's what six years. It was well over 30, and during this time was one of the biggest booms in real estate in the 80s. Today's buyers wouldn't want to purchase home in 81 because homes were cheap. Standard single-family home cost sixty-six thousand dollars. That was back in the late 70s, early 80s, 81. By the mid 80s, you know, 100, 150 was what it would take to get a decent house, right? But incomes are also different. Typical household made $19,000. So, what is that? A quarter? No, that's about a third, right? Now you're talking household income of 73 and 410. It's about the same ratio. The difference is you have interest rates. Interest rates were 18% in 1981. Now they're maybe, let's call it 8%. Seems high, but it's not as high as it was. That doesn't give anybody any comfort into what the, how hard it is to buy a house now, and nor should it. But it does put it in perspective. It does put it in perspective to where if you are in the housing market, number one, it used to be worse. Number two, it indicates something else that could be worse of a problem. Number one is that economists see a potential rally in the housing market. Housing market could go up even more. Why would there be a rally? Well, it all gets back to supply and demand. Home builders are not building new houses at the same rate that they were back then because of the fact that from 2008 until now, that's 15 years, there's never been a long run more than three or four years of good economics for home builders. 2008, 9, and 10. There was the housing market crash. Builders, a lot of them went bankrupt. A lot of them went out of business. The ones that could hang in there didn't, um, they didn't fall over themselves to build huge subdivisions. Let's put it that way. Once you got out of the other side of the housing market crash in 2012, let's say, there were some builders that were still around. Many of them were very cautious. And the ones that were building houses, they were building at a drip 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 basis from 2012 13 and 14. now once you got to 2014 they started going like gangbusters maybe for five years from 2014 to 2019 building houses very quickly then what happened of course now we have pandemic so when the pandemic hits a lot of builders went into survival mode they figured this is going to be a crash like 2008 was we're not gonna fall into that trap again so they clamped down sold a lot of equipment put a lot of projects on mothballs canceled a lot of permits for almost a year all through 2020 builders were kind of on ice 
And then it became apparent at the end of 2020, beginning of 21, wait a minute, people want to buy new houses. So they turn on the tap again, 2021, 2022. Well, now interest rates spiked up. They were at two or three percent, then they went up to five and six and now seven. So then the builders pulled back a little bit. Wait, the mar the interest rates are too high and people can't afford homes. Well, just within the last six months, beginning of 2023, builders realized it doesn't matter that the interest rates are high because people still are buying houses. So let's turn on the tap again. So it's, this has been like a herky-jerky start and stop for builders. What does that do? That makes the new house market very unstable. The houses aren't being built in large volumes by a lot of builders. And the rates might go up again. And you might think, well, new houses aren't the only ones on the market. That's true. There's also resale houses. And you would think when interest rates go up and there's a demand that all of a sudden there would be a change in the housing market. Prices will go down and more people will be able to afford homes. But here's the problem. Why isn't the housing market behaving the way it's supposed to? And supposed to is a judgment. That's an opinion. Supposed to just goes by history. Well, it did this before, so it's supposed to do it again. Well, that assumes everything is the same. Rate hiking campaign last March, the housing market responded predictably, mortgage rates climbed, leading to eventual decline in home prices. But after 10 rate hikes, the market is anything but predictable. Mortgage rates have likely peaked. We'll see in a minute why maybe that's not true. Home prices still keep increasing. Why are home price prices increasing? even though mortgage rates are almost 7% and about ready to go to 8 and we'll see why in a minute. Why would home prices keep going up if mortgage rates go up? Well, it's not a direct comparison between the two. Mortgage rates don't automatically make house prices go down. Because remember, just because a buyer wants to pay less for a house doesn't make it happen until the seller also agrees to that price right it's supply and demand well on the demand side if a lot of buyers are saying i can't afford it i don't want to pay this much for a house your house is not worth six hundred thousand. that's great that's one person's opinion if the other side of that equation the seller doesn't agree and say yeah you're right i'll sell it for 500 it's not going to happen the buyer can think six five hundred all they want but the seller has to agree to that supply and demand side. Supply and demand have to come together. Why wouldn't a home seller adjust their price when the interest rate goes up? Well, the interest rate doesn't affect them. If you have a house and you're already living in it, your interest rate was set back when you bought it or refinanced it. You probably have a 3 or 4% interest rate. If your interest rate goes up, that doesn't put any financial pressure on you to sell. If the interest rates go up to 15%, you can just stay huddled down, hunker down in your house and enjoy your 3% mortgage. Why would you give that up? Well, what if the housing prices crash? Who cares? It's not like stocks. You're not losing cash. If you bought a house for $250,000 and it went up to $600,000, and then it goes back down to 400000 in theory, on paper, that money doesn't come out of your bank account. Unlike a 401k fund or a stock market account, your balance, you don't get a statement every month that says, oh, your house is only worth four hundred. Who cares what it's worth? You're living in it. You're, you get to use it. The value going up and down doesn't affect you at all unless you want to sell it. And the only reason that people want to sell a house, one of three reasons, either you have to move or you want to move to another house, either a different location, bigger house, right? Or you have a financial problem. You have financial pressure. Well, here's the, here's the fact. Over the last 15 years, since 2008 housing price crash, housing market crash, lenders did not let people buy homes unless they were very well qualified. 
right? In the 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s, anybody with a heartbeat and a pulse and a could fog a mirror could buy a house. Didn't matter your credit. Didn't matter your down payment. That's what made the housing market crash. Well, after that, they put all kind of rules and laws in place that said, if you're a mortgage company, you're lending to these people, you have to make solid sure that they have good credit, they have a good job, they have a good income, their income supports what they're borrowing, right? So if you're buying a $300,000 house, you have to make X amount of money, right? You can't oversell people into mortgages. For the last 15 years, that's the way it was. So there's not a lot of people that are financially distressed because it was very, very stringent underwriting guidelines for these lenders. And if somebody wanted to buy a house or get a refinance mortgage, you have to qualify big time. So now all the people who are living in these used houses, these resale houses that could be inventory for people to buy, there's no reason for them to sell. Just because the market goes down doesn't force them to sell. It doesn't, it doesn't affect them financially. In fact, if anything, when housing prices go down, that's a benefit to homeowners who want to stay because your insurance rates, your property taxes are all based on the assessed value of the house. So if your house goes from 250 to 500, your insurance is going to go up. Your taxes will go up. If the housing market goes down, you can maybe save some money on insurance and taxes. So if you're a homeowner that's living in your house and has no reason to move, house price, let it go down. Who cares? It doesn't affect me. That It doesn't make the four walls any less desirable. It doesn't make the roof any less desirable. Right? So the market doesn't determine sellers. The seller is going to sell either because they have to move or want to move. They have financial distress, which is rare because of the underwriting or because there's some outlier event. There's a divorce, a death in the family, something where somebody doesn't need the house. Right now, none of those three things are very common, right? Financial distress is rare because of underwriting. Yeah, divorce, death in the family, it happens, but it's not a major reason why there's millions of houses on the market. There are people who have to move for their job, but now work from home is a big deal. So that's not as popular, common. Uh, there's also people that want to move maybe to a bigger house. But now if you're looking at a bigger house, it may be more desirable just to put an addition on your existing house. Because look, if you have a house that you paid two fifty dollars for, now it's worth five hundred. dollars You have a 3% mortgage. On your 250, you're probably paying two grand a month on your mortgage payment. Now you want to buy a house that's bigger. Well, if your current house is 500, how much is a bigger house going to be? 700? Well, now not only do you have to pay the extra 250 or 200 to cover the difference in the house, but you also have to pay a higher interest rate on the whole thing. Because if your rate is 3% now, now you're going to pay eight. Well, guess what? 8% mortgage on a 700 house is? That's like five grand. So your payments kind of go up three thousand a month, thirty six thousand dollars a year for the rest of your life just to upgrade house. So what if you instead took a hundred thousand dollars cash and just put an addition on your house? You'd have that equaled out in three years on your mortgage payment. If you went to a bigger house and spent thirty uh, three thousand dollars more a month on mortgage, that's thirty six thousand a year times three years is a hundred grand. In three years, you'll have already paid the extra amount for the addition, plus you have to keep paying that three thousand a month more interest. So why not just take a hundred grand, slap an addition on your house? If you have to borrow it, you borrow it. But that's a lot better than switching out your low interest rate mortgage. So are mortgages going up or down? Well, a lot of people think that mortgage rates are too high and they're going down. But we've seen before where mortgage rates were over 10% for a very long time. In fact, there's a lot of talk that mortgage rates may have peaked, but on the other hand, mortgage rates might go to 8%. The labor market is putting pressure on mortgage rates. Well, how did the, how do those two things relate? Well, 
mortgage rates have an origin with the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve Bank sets the um, basic interest rate for interbank lending. And they use that rate to speed up or slow down the economy. If the economy is getting too overheated, they will raise rates to slow it down. What makes an economy get overheated? Well, labor data, right? The mortgage rates have been rising close to the 2023 high. To make things more complicated, the spreads are getting wider. The question is, will labor data push mortgages to 8%? Well, jobless claims are low, meaning that people filing for unemployment, that number's low. And the labor market is holding steady, which means the economy is healthy. When the economy is healthy, the Federal Reserve needs to raise rates in order to slow it down. So basically, if a lot of people have jobs, the government has to artificially throw a monkey wrench into the economy by jacking up interest rates to slow down the economy so prices don't get out of hand. Which begs the question, does America need more unemployment? Right? Is more unemployment good? The economy itself is under strains. For every unemployed person, there are 1.6 jobs. Right? This is a pretty high number. So for every person that doesn't have a job, there's more than one and a half jobs available. Wage growth has been fast for service. Will these gains survive when labor shortages feed through prices? So what happens is when companies have to pay more to get employees, they have to raise their price, which makes inflation go up. Wage growth would be around 6% per year. That's more than um, the inflation. Optimists hope that the labor market can carry on as it has cooling down, but not having too many people unemployed. Well, here's the thing. Let's talk about employment, because this is something that a lot of people are interested in. Next time you go to any kind of local business, a restaurant, a shop, a store, ice cream stand, anywhere, ask how's business. You guys busy. Talk to somebody you know who's an employer. One of the first things they'll say is, I can't get anybody to work. We were at a small little um, cafe a week or so ago. Asked my normal question, how's business? And the guy who was there happened to be the owner. He said, great, but I can't get anybody to work. Can't get any workers. In fact, they wanted to open for breakfast. They're open for lunch and early dinner. I think they close at four. But they wanted to open for breakfast. They tried to open for breakfast, came out with a great menu, but they hired two people to work. And after a week or two, they stopped showing up. One of them wouldn't come to work and they had to stop opening for breakfast. They could make more money. They could have more revenue. They could hire more people. People didn't want to work. On a larger scale, you have 1.6 jobs for every unemployed person. Why don't all those unemployed people take those jobs? So the question is, what are the factors that go into people not wanting to work? Well, I'll throw a few out there and you can put messages in the comments below what you think. One could be that there was a lot of money that was thrown out there during the pandemic, stimulus, rebate checks. You didn't have to pay your rent. There was rent moratoriums. You also had student loan moratoriums. During that time, people didn't need as much income. They didn't need to work as much. Plus, a lot of businesses shut down. There was a lot of work from home. People got used to a more comfortable life where you didn't have to work as hard because you didn't have as much responsibility for payments. So once you get that in your head, you don't have to work 40 hours a week. Maybe that becomes a norm. Is that a factor? Another factor that's been thrown out there, and we've talked about this in some business um, forums, is overuse of technical you know, tech devices, people on the phones too much, playing video games, computers. 
does that take away from the ambition that people have? I'm not saying it's good or bad. Maybe people just want to live a more relaxed life, not have to burn themselves out for a job, maybe not have a have a personal life that's more balanced with work, right? Uh, maybe you don't want to just you know wear yourself out for your boss. There's nothing wrong with that. But what is the reason? Some people have suggested that um, diets have affected people's energy level where it slows it down. Some other people have even said the fact that traditional families are less common and also less desirable and even in some ways that are discouraged by society. Don't have a traditional family. Be a blended family, right? Be, you know, different identities. That may take away from job ambitions. How is that? Well, the biggest reason many people, especially head of household, go to work and work a job that's, that's you know, distasteful or brutal or hard work is because they want to support their family. You know, people will kill themselves working to support their family. We can go into a job they hate because they want to be the, you know, bringing home the bacon. That's a cliche. Now, if you don't have that family waiting home depending upon you because you're living by yourself, you're single, right? Maybe there's two people in a blended relationship. Why are you going to go to work and kill yourself? Just relax. Sit on the couch, watch TV, maybe make a little bit of money, maybe get some stimulus money. Maybe you don't have to pay your rent, don't have to pay your student loans. Why the heck would you want to work? Again, I'm not saying this is good or bad. I'm just guessing at the reasons why companies are having so hard time finding employees. And the answer is always, well, they're not paying enough or it's a bad job or, you know, they're mean bosses. That could all be true. But this is all true before. Wages are higher than they've ever been. How much would it take to get you to come to work? We have some contractor friends of ours that pay 60 to $70 an hour for framers, construction workers, still can't get help. So I don't think it's the money because I don't think people really need money. You can actually live a pretty comfortable life with very little money. We watched a documentary this week. There was a, um, a guy who goes around the country and looks at different areas of the country to kind of show how people live. And he went out to rural West Virginia, what they call the hollers, where you, people live in these little canyons. And they say people live out here for two or $300 a month because they own their home. You know, properties may be worth 30 grand. They paid it off a long time ago. They get some low income assistance, you know, food stamps or whatever they call it, SNAP. Uh, maybe they get government checks for a few hundred dollars. Put all that together, they grow some food in their property. You know, they could do part time job or some other, you know, little side gig for a couple hundred a month and live. Now, you're not going to have a Ferrari. You're not going to go on vacation all the time. But for these people, living a comfortable, relaxing life is more rewarding. Get to spend time with your family, your dog, you know, go up in the woods, go hunting, right? What's wrong with that? So who knows what it is? If you have guesses or opinions about what is holding back the employment market, put those in the messages below. Let us know what you think. Love to hear everybody's opinion. When we come back, we're going to talk about vehicles, automobile market. Used car prices are crashing quickly. And this is fact. This is coming from early on in the supply chain. When the cars first go to auction, before they go to dealerships, the house, the, the car prices are crashing, which means prices at dealerships may be 20 or 30% lower, thousands less in the coming weeks and months. And you want to hear about this. So stand by for a moment. We'll take a quick break and we'll come back with the automobile market projection. Pretty quick. 
So here is here are the facts, as we always do. We don't do opinions that much. If we do, they're always backed up by facts. Here are the facts. Auto remarketing, which is a news media of the pre-owned industry. It's pretty clear what they do. That's all they write about. Largest month-over-month -month drop in Mannheim used car price index. Well, what's Mannheim? If you don't know, Mannheim is the largest used car auction uh, chain in the country. They have, I believe, 200 auctions. They sell, um, they actually they actually claim that they have billions of interactions a year. And by interactions, it means bids on cars, people trying to buy cars, people trying to sell cars. They have millions per year. And that means that um, they know more than anybody about the used car market. Matter of fact, they have what's called MMI, Mannheim Market Index, that all the dealers use to keep track of what cars are selling for. Well, their index dropped the steepest month over month drop. And this is a big deal. This is four point in one month. If you extrapolate that out, 4% in one month, if you multiply that times 12 months, that's 50% drop in new car value. It may not drop 4% every month, but even if it drops 20 or 30% in a year, you have a ten thousand dollar car, used car. It's going to be worth six or seven grand in a year. That's a pretty big drop. That's what the dealers are seeing. Um, Cox Automotive owns Mannheim. U.S. wholesale price take a dive. Analysts with the firm anticipate less volatility through the end of twenty three, but it's still here's MMI Mannheim Used Vehicle Index. It's still a big deal. Why is this happening? Well, here is one factor in the mix. One is used cars are typically purchased by less credit worthy buyers. Most people with good credit, good incomes, they buy a new car. Not everybody. There's some multimillionaires that buy used cars because they recognize the value. But most of them are bought by less credit worthy. Well, the banks are cracking down on lending because they see that there might be some employment issues. The interest rates are much higher. So when you look at a used $30,000 car at 12% and a new $45,000 car at 7%, the payment's not much different. So more people might be gravitating towards new cars if you can get approved at the same time there was a shortage of used cars when the pandemic hit and the used car or the new car factory shut down in 2020 and 21 and there were supply chain issues and chips and all that stuff there wasn't as many used cars well they started ramping back up in 2022 well now you're starting to see right now 2024 cars are coming out so a 2022 is a two-year-old car. That's a used car. You're starting to see more used cars coming into the marketplace, which means supply and demand. The other factor is the new cars are having more of a moment of inventory availability. Part of the reason that used cars spiked up in 2021 and 22 is because there were no used cars. I'm sorry, there were no new cars. So used cars spiked up. You went to go to a new car dealership to buy a brand new Jeep Wrangler and there were none on the lot, but there was a used car. You bought that because that's all there was because of the pandemic chip backlog. That's over because now there are new cars. Throw those two things together and used cars are crashing. So if you're in the market for a used car, you can find a low mileage, late model, decent price car, you might maybe wait another month or two because this Mannheim index are cars that are selling right now at Mannheim. They may take a month or so to get to the dealer's lot, get reconditioned, to get out in, in the market. One thing people don't realize is whatever they pay for at the auction, by the time it gets to the dealer's lot, there may be another $2,000 in cost. So if you're a uh, used car dealer or even a new car dealer and you go to Mannheim and you buy a car for $20,000, you probably have to spend a thousand or so to get it shipped to your lot. 
you probably have to spend a thousand or so reconditioning the car, fixing little dents, little scratches, you know, repairing things, new brakes, new tires. The average reconditioning cost right now for a late model car, I believe, is about fourteen hundred. So now you have shipping for a thousand, fourteen hundred for reconditioning. Uh, you're probably going to spend a few hundred on advertising on average per car, maybe a hundred a month for a few months. So now you have three thousand dollars worth of expense. So now your real cost of that car is twenty three thousand. If you're a used car dealer, how much profit do you need to make? Maybe two or three thousand. Even if you make ten percent, ten percent profit on a twenty three thousand dollar car, that's twenty three hundred. So now you take that twenty three plus another three grand, that's twenty six thousand. So maybe you start out by adver advertising it for twenty eight nine, twenty eight thousand discount a couple thousand negotiating right so just because that car was purchased for twenty thousand doesn't mean that's what it's going to show up for on the used car dealers lot it'll probably show up at 28 28 5 get discounted a couple thousand all the other fees are paid dealer makes a couple grand boom that's how it goes but those wholesale prices are coming down now let's talk about new car market what's going on man there's some crazy stuff happening in the new car market well as you know evs electric vehicles are all the rage according to the dealers and the manufacturers and the government um they're shipping big volumes they're making more evs than anything else but these evs are just sitting on dealers lots as supply outgrows demand EVs were once limited supply. Now it's become limited demand. EVs are sitting on dealers' lots for far longer cars, piling up as buyers mostly continue to overlook electric vehicles. 51% of buyers say they are considering used EV, which is up from 38%. They're interested, but there's too many cars. No one in the U.S. really wants to buy an electric vehicle. In fact, there's a lot of incentives, tax incentives, rebates, government incentives, inc incentives from uh, um, energy companies, utilities. If you put a EV plug in your house, they'll give you a couple some places. Question number one, do you want an EV? How do you feel about EVs? something you want in your life or not well you may not have a choice now here's an article we're going to show this comes from you know a, a news source that has a, a certain bias against evs right republicans bash biden's woke ev rule right could that be more biased again agree or not democrats obsession with sounding the alarm on climate change okay let's skip over all that however the Environmental Protection Agency has a rule that would force automakers to make more electric vehicles. The proposed rule would force manufacturers to grow today's 8% share to 67% share by 2032. That's less than 10 years away. So right now, the market share of EVs is 8% that's happening right now. And I was going to say happening naturally, but it's really not natural because there's still incentives on these cars and a lot of um how should i say a lot of suggestive force behind manufacturers making these evs right um being billed as existing standards proposed rule is the next phase and top to bottom attempt to reach the automobile industry and the people who don't like evs are pushing back against it. again how far this goes where it goes who knows but it just goes to show that there are forces behind manufacturers making electric vehicles whether these you agree with these forces or not doesn't matter there is something happening so you might want to prepare for the fact that evs are coming down the pipeline so we'll stay in the automotive section for a minute and then we'll jump to cyber um insurance and commercial insurance there is a phenomenon that happens in the used car market called curb stoning 
This has been going on for 50 years. I can remember back in the 70s and 80s, there were curbstone dealers. What is a curbstoner? A curbstoner is a car dealer who puts ads in the classifieds. Could be Craigslist, could be, um, I don't know, could be... Um, Maybe Facebook Marketplace could be um, Auto Trader or your local newspaper that says, look, here's this car for sale. And it kind of makes it seem like they're a dealer. But really what it is, is a non-licensed person who is out there flipping cars. They buy these cars from maybe salvage auctions, maybe repos maybe um, backdoor used car dealers that could buy all their rejects. Maybe they buy them from other people that are selling them in distress. And what they do is they resell them to unsuspecting buyers. Now, the fact that you're not buying it from a dealer means you don't get any protection. This is an article from Western North Carolina about curbstoning on the rise. Again, this is not a new thing. This is 50 years old. Curb stoning is when someone buys a car through online classifieds, finds a problem, and then resells it for more than it's worth. They call it curb stoning because you're selling cars off the curb rather than from a dealership. Um, by the time you're a victim, it's too late. It's a lot like flipping a house when a buyer makes a purchase through classified and then turns around and flips it. Now, you can flip a house legally. The problem is vehicle resale is, is regulated under law. When a buyer doesn't the title the vehicle in their name, and then flips it, that's curb stoning, and it's illegal. If you're a buyer of a vehicle, you have to put the title in your name first, get a new title before you sell it to somebody else. And they do this without a dealer's license. How is that going to be a problem for you as a buyer? Well, if you buy a vehicle from a curb stoner, first of all, you have no warranty, nobody to complain to if there's something wrong with that vehicle. You can't complain about them on Yelp. Can't call the Better Business Bureau. You can't even complain to the dealer licensing division of your state because they're not a licensed dealer. They're just some guy flipping cars. Sometimes they pretend like they're a dealer. Sometimes they even make up a fake dealer name. The other problem is paperwork. A lot of times these curb stoners give you a title. It's what's called a skip title or a jump title where the back of it's not filled in, right? The front of it is a legal title. But the back of it is just an open title or a skip title or a jump title. You show up at the DMV with a jump title, they're going to confiscate your title and you won't be able to title your car. So watch out for these curb stoners. This is getting to be uh, a, a recurring thing for about 10 years in the 90s and 2000s. It was pretty much shut down because there's a lot of regulation and enforcement. Well, now with government agencies being defunded and investigations being um, not prioritized, there's more curb stoners out there. And now when you complain about it or you call the police or anything else, they say it's a civil matter where you, they don't really do anything about it unless there's some very egregious violations, which usually there's not. So beware of buying cars from somebody, unless you can see their dealer's license and you can see a copy of the title that's properly endorsed, you want to try to avoid that scenario. So we're going to come back and talk about cyber risk, cyber insurance, cyber protection. If you're a small business, medium business, even a civilian consumer, resident, residential property owner, you may have risk for cyber losses, which you may have no coverage for. You may think you have insurance coverage. You may think you're protected, but you have no coverage for. So we're going to come back and talk about that cyber risk here that everybody should uh, be aware of and maybe talk to your insurance broker about what's available because it's pretty cheap.
All right. Cyber attack, cyber insurance. It's not a huge, hugely popular subject, but it is becoming more and more prevalent in the news. You're hearing about ransomware, cyber attacks, companies being shut down because of insurance. We had uh, a story last week where there was a hospital that completely went out of business because they were attacked by a hacker. What goes into these kind of hacks and what coverage is available? Well, let's first talk about how you can protect yourself. Um, cyber insureds, meaning that if you're a person that has an insurance policy, you're getting pulled in a lot of directions. There's a lot of noise. If you go to buy a cyber policy, you're going to find that there's all kinds of different exclusions, exceptions. Uh, businesses need help cutting through cyber security noise getting a lot of different alerts, pulled in a lot of directions of what they should spend their cyber money on. Industry leading cyber loss ratio of 36%, which is a very low loss ratio. What does it mean? What this means is the risk to a business or even a household from a cyber attack is higher than it's ever been. But you want to mitigate that with some best practices. Obviously, you can't protect against every single attack. Look behind me, all these computers. Every one of these computers connected to the internet is a potential a potential vector or entry point for a hacker. Once they get into one computer, they're in the network, they're in the, in the router, you're done. Everything is shut down. So can you protect all of them? Well, you can, but that's hard to do. What about things you forget about? What about your phone, right? Everybody has one or more mobile devices in their household. Every one of those connects to your Wi-Fi. Now that's in your network. Can you protect everyone? What if somebody comes to visit your business is on your Wi-Fi, a customer? Can you protect that phone? Maybe not. So what happens is the cyber insurance companies, they know about all of these potential losses. And instead of just saying, hey, if you have a loss, we'll pay you like an insurance claim, like if you crash your car, we'll fix it. They also put best practice apps, protections, patches on your system. They may put it at the router. They may put on a few computers to detect if something comes into one of them. But they're going to do more than just pay you if something goes wrong. They're probably going to put some defense in front of your screen. And here's the thing. It's all done behind the scenes. And... They're one step ahead of the hackers because unlike the insurance company, you're only exposed to hacking attempts that come to your company. There are thousands, tens of thousands of hackers out there. They're all using different methods to try to attack a system. If the method that's trying to attack your system is not one you're ready for, they're going to get in. They're going to get into your system. The only ones you can protect against are the kind that you are aware of. Maybe you read about it somewhere. Maybe your IT person read about it. Maybe you were hacked before and now you're protecting against that. But you don't know how your business competitor down the street were, was hacked or they tried to hack them. Your insurance company knows this because they have to insure hundreds or thousands of companies. And because they insure these this group of companies, they know that – there's hundreds of ways they try to get in and they know all the ways. So they're going to watch for all the methods that are used for your company. And they're going to try to prevent those from happening. Cause look, they have more to lose than you do. If there's a hack, they got to pay. So they're out to try to keep that from happening. Not just pay if it does, because if you know, you have, let's say a million dollar policy on hacking, Maybe even with a 5000 deductible. If a hack comes in and does $2,000 worth of damage, yeah, you have to come out of pocket 5000 for your deductible. The insurance company has to come out of pocket 200000 They have more to lose. So they're going to be out there trying to protect from that event, that loss, that risk ever happening. So use the insurance company to your advantage. You just don't want to have an IT person. You want to use best practices. In fact, your insurer will probably require that. Let's do, do, do a little overview about what goes into cyber insurance and even commercial lines in general. 
What is cyber insurance, the definition and cost? Cyber insurance or cyber security insurance is an insurance policy which covers losses that you might suffer from a data breach or cyber attack. Pretty simple, right? History of cyber insurance. It's been around for 20 years, but not really that significantly. It really started in the late 2000s, like 2008 or nine. So it's really like 15 years old. And agencies were reluctant at first to take on the risk and cyber exposure was so new there weren't any ways to do loss protection but here's the thing they now have 15 or so years under their belt the reason this is important to know is your insurance agent or broker has a hundred years of knowing about fire insurance slip and fall lawsuits so they know that inside and out cyber insurance is maybe 15 years old plus it's changed even during that 15 years the kind of hacks have changed the market is expecting to reach 29 billion by 2027 we just saw uh, another um survey that said you're thinking 50 billion by the end of the century so 29 there'll be 50 or end of the decade 50 billion dollars used to be that cyber policies were add-ons to liability now they're their own policy. Why is it important? We talked about that. Regulations are increasing. It used to be that they're excess and surplus lines. Now they're in, um, admitted carriers for the most part. Uh, benefits. Some of the main benefits are you get forensic support. We talked about it. Coverage, but also defense against losses. And also BI, business interruption. That means that if business is interrupted, it pays Make sure your policy covers this. Not not all of them do. It pays your losses during that time. If you don't collect revenue for two weeks, it pays your revenue. Make sure you understand because not every policy covers everything. What are the issues? The issue is sometimes it's hard to get if you're sloppy with your record keeping. Different types of coverage. How does it work? Let's see about cost, right? Um, you want to have about one or two years worth of revenue for coverage. And that's going to cost roughly, let's take a look. It says here 10,000 to 25,000. They're talking about a um, $10 million business. We are seeing premiums for a million dollars for roughly 1500 bucks a year is there a deductible yeah probably thousand bucks to five thousand you can make your deductible higher we would recommend going with the highest deductible you can afford because your premium will probably go down drastically if you raise your deductible so go with the highest deductible you can afford and still be okay that's our recommendation on that subject of insurance, we're going to talk briefly about commercial lines, commercial policies, what's happening in commercial lines. Bottom line is that um, rates increase about 5%. That's not bad. That's not bad. Um, when you have commercial lines going up 5%, they call that holding steady. It's not a very hard market. It's okay. You can actually get insurance. And this comes from Market Scout CEO. This is a great company out of Texas. Um, they know everything about um, the commercial lines market. Um, they're talking about different industry classes, even breaking it down. Property insurance up 10%. Most coverages are up about 5 to 7%. This is a good type of insurance to have right here, umbrella excess whatever type of insurance you have on your business property insurance business interruption business owners policy work comp commercial auto whatever you have talk to your agent or broker about an umbrella policy what this does is it increases your limits on all your policies to a high number let's say if you have you know a commercial property in policy on your building for 1.5 million maybe you have a business owner's policy for a million maybe you have a gl policy general liability for two million whatever your different policies are you can buy an umbrella policy let's say for five million 
that raises your coverage to five million on all your policies underlying, and it might only cost you thousand fifteen hundred a year. And the reason why it's cheap is because they only pay the overage over that base policy. Now you have to have coverage underneath it. You can't just buy a um, an umbrella policy by itself. It, it goes over in excess of what your existing policies are, and it's only going to pay if the existing policy covered the loss. So make sure. You know, don't take our word for it. Get with your broker, get with a broker to make sure you understand what's covered. But one of the best deals on commercial insurance is adding an umbrella. You're adding extra coverage over and above all your existing policies. And it's just like, it's not like what it sounds like. It's an umbrella. It covers more than just what you have. So that's another good episode of Describe TV. We talked about a lot of things. Now, remember, if you have the interest in talking to an expert in any one of these subjects, automotive, insurance, general contracting, investigations, mediation, pre-legal, all these things, remember, you can reach an actual human and talk to a licensed, certified expert in any one of these fields. Um, if you're having trouble getting through to a real person at a company or you're getting the runaround from a salesperson and you just want a second opinion, um, feel free to reach out to us uh, and talk to a real person. Keep track of our channels no matter where you're watching it, YouTube, Rumble, Facebook, uh, Twitter. Um, we're on all those channels. Bookmark it, search us, send us a message, and be sure to make yourself aware of what you can access through Actual Human. Are you tired of automated systems and chatbots when you need assistance? Experience ActualHuman.com and connect with real professionals, not automation. At ActualHuman.com, we bring you a network of professionals who are excited to answer your questions and provide guidance. Getting started is easy. Let us show you how. Here's how it works. Step 1. Select the best date and time for your video call. Step 2. Describe your situation and the areas you're looking for advice. Step three, connect one-on-one -on -one with an expert and get the undivided attention that you deserve. Experience the difference. Visit actualhuman.com today and schedule your professional consultation.